Hello? Hello, James. How are you? Good morning, everybody. It feels like afternoon and evening, because I have been um, up a little while. I have the pleasure of introducing Miguel. Uh, I met him 11 years ago when I jumped off a plane to New York, not knowing anybody. And this gentleman worked in the office that I did and has his own business. And I think anybody that's managed to run their own agency for that many years has, has some secret sauce, right? Started in video production uh, and now is moving a lot more into VR, AR, AI, depending on what version of those letters you want to do. And he's a good old fashioned gentleman, has two twins, and is thrown in from New York and is going to talk about kind of his version of, of the world and AI. And I think at this time at the end, we're going to try for some Q&A as well. Cool. Go ahead. Thank you. So my talk, I'm going to try to make it interactive. I don't know how many of you were here for the last talk, but um, part of what I want to tell you about is how AI is going to change everything. And everybody knows that, but how, how to not be left behind, right? So my story starts in the Bronx. I, I was born in the Bronx in the 80s, right? And uh, if you remember that, that time, which most people do, what they think about is this, right? They think about the Bronx is burning. They think, you know, worst, one of the worst places in the world. And from my perspective, I grew up right here, like a little bit over from the fire. <laughs> um, and the way a person like me gets out of a situation like that is you gotta develop a mind state. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you guys repeat the mind state so you remember it. I had to tell myself it won't be me, right? I see all these things around me that won't be me. I won't allow what I see to be me. So when, when I say that, I want you to repeat it. Let's start. It won't be me. It won't be me. All right. <laughs> it won't be me. One of the biggest innovations when I was growing up in the 80s was hip hop. I literally grew up right in the middle of the South Bronx while hip hop was being made. And I see a huge correlation to where AI is going and what happened with hip hop. In 1977, there was a blackout. There was a, this guy had a skill set. He had knowledge on how to take a turntable and, and make it make sounds nobody else knew how to make. So he had a set of knowledge, data, that other people didn't have. And he also had equipment which was very expensive and most people in the Bronx could not afford it. So they couldn't be in that innovation yet. But something happened that changed that. There was a blackout in 1977. And during that blackout, there, were, there was looting all across New York City. In the Bronx, all the, the music stores got looted for its DJ equipment. What happens next is Many, many, many people that didn't have the opportunity got DJ equipment, and now they started to put on shows in the park. And this is where the birth of hip hop started to happen. More people having that innovation in their hands and more eyes on them and more ways to test and innovate created a multi-billion dollar industry. Forbes did a, a study on it, and every pre and. All of this, I have a presentation. If you go to that URL, it won't be .me. You can download it. I have a bunch of examples. You can link out to everything. So Forbes, and, and anybody who knows hip hop is one of the, glo one of the biggest global industries, right? Um, music industry specifically, but hip hop is the biggest part of music right now. What happened though? This place, the Bronx, created this multi-billion dollar industry and musicians only still see 12% of that revenue. And, and this, this is gonna be a pattern that, that I'm gonna get deeper and deeper in. And the reason, another part of this is AI is pattern recognition in itself, right? AI is allowed to see things that we can't see. It has data that we, we can't even imagine to have in our, in our brains. So this place, South Bronx, creates a multi-billion dollar industry. The people that innovated in it didn't capitalize on it as much as they could, and the place that created it is still to this day one of the poorest places in the world, in the country for sure. 38% of people live below the poverty line. So again, I see the correlation between AI and the Bronx in the 80s. What, what, where is this gonna go once the jobs start to go away, the opportunities start to go away? 
it won't be me. <laughs> Say it. <laughs> so I thought, okay, hip hop, I, I was lucky enough to be in that environment to understand what I understand. And I said, okay, how does this correlate to AI and how would I make sure it won't be me that that happens to so the way I got to where I got, I was able to create my own company and work in AI and work with all these big brands, even work with this guy here, <laughs> um, is innovation, right? I, I had to say, okay, what's gonna make me the biggest jumps? And, and one of the biggest things right now, and I don't know if you saw the last talk, AI is able to make some of the biggest jumps because it, it thinks much faster than us, it can do things much better than us as humans. There's things that we can't do 5,000 times in an hour, where this thing can. What AI is, most people think AI, they think the Terminator, right? Oh, this guy's gonna come, uh, Skynet, right? But what AI really is, is data that is put together through algorithms, right? So, for instance, I'll give you an example. Waze, you open up your, your Waze app, you're about to go to Manhattan from Queens. Sorry, New York references. Um, Queens. Um, and the data, Waze knows data that you can't possibly know. It knows on the route there's an accident. It knows that the traffic is heavier during this time of day most times. So it's going to send you around that. And you as a person, you just open Waze and take the data and go. You don't really understand all the different data sets that are around creating that route for you. So what AI truly is, is a prediction engine. It takes data you can't possibly have and gives you an idea of what you should do, you still get to make the decision, right? You can choose a different route. But Waze will give you the ones that it believes is the most um, fastest route for you. So what does this mean? Again, it makes me think, it won't be me. It won't be me. <laughs> so my story starts out very similar to hip hop. One day, my father and my mother bring a box into my room. They tell me, I, we bought it off the truck. If you don't know what that means in the Bronx, that meant a lot like the looting, those guys sold those things that they found. And my parents bought a computer off a truck. Thank God they did because I wouldn't be standing here <laughs> if they didn't, right? I got the opportunity. I got the DJ equipment of the future. So I went on to work for some of the biggest brands in the world, um, creating um, interactive advertising and, and video production, and when I started really working as, a, as an employee, I, one of my first jobs was working on, on Disney's um, Pixar um, banner advertising. So this was when, I don't know, I'm gonna date myself, but this was when Flash was, a, was the most popular thing um, in our industry, right? So, but this was when Flash banners were like 30K, and if you're technical, you know that means like, that's really hard to, to make animation, right? So what I started to do was, I started to figure out how to innovate in my job. What that meant was, I had to stay late every night to like two o'clock in the morning to figure things out. And my bosses didn't really care much for the innovation, they just wanted me to finish, right? But from my perspective, I always thought, it won't be me, I'm gonna make sure I'm ahead of the curve. So one day, we had a project for The Incredibles, and I realized, I can fake load a video into a flash banner by some, some super magic, I won't get too technical in it for you. This was before Flash even had video inside of it. So what I did was, I created this fake video, I put it on my server, and I loaded it into a flash banner. This had never been done before. Um, and when it, when it played, it, it, it was, it was, it was a, a great experience, everybody loved it. And they, when they asked me how I did it, my bosses asked me how I did it, I pretty much broke, broke so many rules by doing it, I had no idea they existed. Disney could have pulled our contract because of that, right? So they said, okay, it was cool that you innovated, but let's do it the right way now. Let's put it on Disney servers, let's, let's do this the right way. So the next campaign, I did it again, and they got like a $30,000 bill <laughs> because I uploaded this video onto a server and they were charging them per, per megabyte, it's early days. So of course, I, I get called back into the office. It just cost us $30,000. And I was like, but it was one of the best ads 
of the year, right? Isn't my job to make creative things, right? And that's when I started to understand most companies are not built for innovation because innovation is not efficient. It's not, hey, just do your job. Innovation is play till you find the creative outlet and you, you hit on something. So I said, I don't know if I'm really built for the full-time job thing. I need to create the future I want to be in. I want to innovate. So I started mass ideation where I said, okay, I'm going to go to brands and agencies and I'm going to help them innovate because it's really hard to do that from inside an environment where it's so structured. So we went on to work with many brands and I'll show you some examples. And, and still to this day, agencies, brands, and startups come to us because they have trouble innovating, right? They're, if they have an idea internally, it's tough for them a lot of times to change their internal systems to rely on the data sets that they are used to to make sure that their bosses are happy with what the money that's being spent, right? So one example was uh, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon, this around the, uh, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with augmented reality? Augmented reality is one of the first iterations of AI that a lot of people got to interact with, but they didn't really fully understand that it was AI. It's AI because it's recognizing images, it's recognizing areas, and then it's overlaying data that's being pulled from wherever, even locally, onto the image. So think about all those things that have to be done on a, on a per second basis. This is all AI programming. So what we created was a experience where um, Capri Sun put in a temporary tattoo, and the temporary tattoo, every time you scanned it, a random thing happened. It pulled in a random video, it did a quiz, it pulled in some cool animations. But this was one of the first campaigns where they also put an advertising budget behind it. And it did very well. This is more recent. Um, I was giving a talk like this and a woman from Chanel was just in the crowd. And she comes up to me after and she said, I can't get my company to innovate as much. I would love to do this kind of stuff. How can you help me do that? So I went in, met with every layer of that company. That's part of it. You have to find a, a, an advocate and then find out how to adjust the parameters of what they view as a win, right? Like if it's just we're spending money in hopes of finding something that is a big win versus we're only gonna spend on things that we know work. And, and this is where I believe it won't be me again. I believe every company in in the world has to figure out how to disrupt itself or there's gonna be another company that's gonna disrupt you. And, and I believe that's part of where I think the AI, uh, and I'll get further into that after this. So this was for okay. Chanel. This is a way to train their salespeople on the, 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 inter, the, the most interesting parts of their watches. So the idea was they would have an experience where people, multiple people, get guided experiences. The common. Guided experiences where someone would speak through the, the, the key features Back. of the watch. So that is AI because if you see that, I don't know, has anybody seen the HoloLens? You know what that is? So it's glasses you put on and it recognizes the real world. It's scanning the room as you move. It sticks a hologram in the middle of space and you can walk around it. So think about all the levels of AI that need to be, be, be used for that. And then it also recognizes language, natural language processing. So when I say something, it does something based on what I said. So as we're working in, in you know, agencies and brands, startups is another natural idea that people would come to us. So randomly, someone called me about this idea of doing mixed reality surgery and if we could help them make their product. What this does is, so super scary stat, a thousand people a day die in surgery because that surgeons don't have the right information that they need. They go into surgery knowing they need certain things, but during the surgery, something can happen where they need other information, data, that they don't have. So they have to make decisions. Again, prediction, decisions. So you, you can see how AI can help surgery, right? You can see how a human has to make decisions based on not having data. It's like trying to drive without ways, right? You're gonna walk right into that traffic and be stuck in traffic. 
So I'll let you watch. Currently, surgeons are faced with poor access to critical and relevant data, poor ergonomics, and poor visualization during surgeries and procedures. In addition, they are often hindered by bulky and obstructive equipment due to outdated systems and technology. My name is Dr. Tran Tu Nguyen. I'm a biomedical engineer and surgeon. I'm also the founder of Optic Surge, which is a health tech company that is transforming surgery with augmented reality. My name is Dr. Justin Samuel, and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon with over 15 years in practice and I am part of the clinical team at Optic Surge. While many solutions have been proposed to improve the surgical process, they do not solve the underlying issues. We don't have the ability to access patients' data and images once we are sterile. Sometimes a difficult operation can be aided by reviewing this information, such as CT scans, in real time to help optimize the patient's outcome. With the Optic Surge surgical platform, we can also access key and relevant data while remaining sterile and maintain our focus on the patient. The Optic Surge system has the potential to transform surgery and help improve patient care intraoperatively. The Optic Surge augmented system is made for surgeons by surgeons and bring in relevant preoperative information combined with real-time intraoperative data in a portable, adaptable, and personalized fashion to give surgeons the tools that they need to help improve patient care. So, if you can see that, that's actually saving lives. AI being used to save lives, right? And it's awesome to be able to figure out how to solve world problems using AI. So, I started my business in uh, 2009, and it was, I, I had an office in Manhattan with Georgina, and uh, I had the opportunity to bring my business back to the Bronx. So there was like this, this internal thing again, it won't be me. So I'm not gonna be the person that, that made it and left and not go back and help the people that, that are still there. So I, I, I went in and I started an incubator with a partner that brought innovative ideas to the Bronx. So there's a lot of people on here. The, the second guy to the, right, uh, to the left, he's making a drone right now that takes um, underwater surveys bridge data with AI and lets the, the government know what, how bad the bridges are so they can go in and fix them. Bad information, a lot of them are super bad. Like, it's, it's scary how, how bad bridges are. But these are innovators that had a community. We started to create a community that an innovator could come to. There's another person in this picture that you may not know, but she's probably one of the most famous people in the world right now. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She came to the incubator and I started helping her with her startup. She had a great idea to help young kids um, learn better through understanding their emotions. She, didn't ha she wasn't able to raise money. She wasn't able to get much traction. So I gave my extra time and my profit to help her build her product. Eventually it didn't work out. She wasn't able to continue and she went on to waitress and I didn't even know it. Um, but it started, to, it started to make me see that there's not enough of a community around innovation to help people like her. Later on, I was able to, to, to create a, an entity called MetaBronx. What MetaBronx was created to do was take innovations from these communities and help them succeed. What does this have to do with AI? These things are gonna start coming up more and more and more, and AI can solve almost any problem in the world. But what happens to the community that creates it? Again, like hip hop. So this is what MetaBronx does. Just a quick. We decided this summer that we were going to work with MetaBronx, which is an organization that does some interesting work on innovation and entrepreneurship in the South Bronx. We have, I think, an obligation to work in collaboration with other organizations that may be educational organizations or social uh, ventures that are trying to improve the life of people in the Bronx. MetaBronx is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, an entrepreneurship education program uh, that works uh, with startups that are uh, owned and operated uh, either by women or a member of a cultural minority. 
That's what happens when you are an entrepreneur. You are literally creating the ideal home that you wish you had. That idea has always been, the only way a community like this changes is if people from different backgrounds really start putting their heads together. As far as the space itself, 4,500 square feet, essentially a complex of uh, production spaces that include uh, media studios, so uh, audio, video, photography, art and design, uh, and then uh, software engineering spaces, more traditional desk with computers. The Glass Files is a technology company. We build software that enables families and individuals to tell their stories and connect them with history. Part of the, the, the connection between me and Philip has been creating an ecosystem that, that feeds all parts of a place like the Bronx, where there's people of low economic circumstances and then people who have made it, left the Bronx, and have come back to help um, take advantage of technology. What we feel like is technology is the leveling of the playing field, and here we're trying to create an ecosystem that brings in people from all over. So, while we were creating that, we started helping the Alexandria Ocasio's of the world to raise millions of dollars. We helped multiple startups raise millions of dollars, and what we started to see was there was a problem. Venture capital is not based on helping the most amount of people. Venture capital is about having the least amount of people make the most amount of money, right? Again, we keep seeing this pattern of less people, you know, winning. So if you look at one example, for instance, Hilton has 169,000 employees and Airbnb has 3,100. Yet, or so, so the, basically, again, the business model is biggest hotel chain will not own any hotels. So again, less people, less things, uh, less people making money. But last year, American consumers spent more money on Airbnb than Hilton. So what does that tell you? Is there's, a, there's a pattern that's gonna start to, um, to, to show that the, the old traditional way of doing business is going to change. Again, AI is, is all over um, Airbnb, right? It, it, there's all kind of prediction engines about you know, how much pricing can cost, and then the less and less people thing is, is the scary part. So again, it won't be me. While I was in, once I started understanding that this is a problem that I keep seeing, I, so I started talking to everybody, and luckily MIT was based, they had, they had a, uh, an arm in the Bronx called MIT Collab. So I come across them and we start working together for Meta Bronx. And they said, I actually may have a solution to what you see. There's this town in Spain called Mondragon. Has anybody heard of this? Because I've never heard, anybody I've asked, nobody's heard of Mondragon, Spain. No? You heard it? Oh, nice. First time ever. Mondragon, Spain is a town of 70,000 people, and they make $15 billion a year in, in revenue, and each person that works in the company shares in revenue, it has a vote, and is winning. It's one of the most equitable places in the world. I think it's the second most equitable place in the world. It means it's one of the best places to live and not have, they have like, no poverty, no, no unemployment rates. So I saw this model and I, start, we, I went and I was able to go and meet with the companies and I started to understand the way they do it. And the idea is they are innovating and letting the people that live there win off the innovations. They have car companies, they have furniture companies, they have uh, translation. The UN contract right now for the, the, um, the translators, is from Mondragon, Spain. They created an innovation that, that is very uh, good and even the UN uses it. But the whole town wins because of that innovation. So how, what does this have to do with AI? Everybody thinks the scary uh, Terminator, right? Experts say in the next 15 years, 40% of all jobs are gonna be taken by AI. These are scary stats. And when I started looking at these stats, I said, okay, what does it take to AI myself and my agency? Because what a lot of people think is, oh, these are the type of jobs it's gonna take. It's gonna take factory work and uh, Amazon's whole fulfillment center is run by robots, right? And you don't see many people in these shots, right? Again, less people, more profit. Then I looked at the truck industry, like, uh, Everybody says one, trucking is one of the biggest jobs. 30% of all jobs in America are trucking. 
And there have pe been people already telling me that they've seen trucks without drivers already. So that's gonna go away. And what happens when that goes away? Drones, delivery, they, another big job that is gonna go away. Um, taxi driving, everybody knows Uber, but if you look last week, Elon Musk said that he could turn on all the Teslas right now and they become driverless taxis. Another huge subset of jobs that go away. So I said, it won't be me, right? Everybody in this room, creatives. AI can't do creative work. <laughs> yes, it can. And, and when I'm in this conversation, I wanna know after, if you think your job is still un ai -able. This was how I got my first job. My first entry level job was literally cutting out images for an e-commerce platform. There's an AI right now that you can just drop the, the images in and it'll cut them out instantly. No entry level job. I would literally not be standing here if that job wasn't available to me. I worked my way up from that job. This job was my mailroom, right? What happens when there's no mailroom? Oh, it can do that, but it can't design, right? Yes, it can. This AI, and again, you can download, there's links to all of this. Um, this AI, you literally type in your company name, industry, it spits out 50 logos for you in like five seconds. So if you're a designer, this is gonna get better, right? This is the first phase of it. And I tried it and it wasn't that bad. And I'm a picky guy when it comes to design. But I see these things and I'm like, uh oh. So you say, okay, it can design, but it can't make my whole marketing, my, my whole collateral, right? Yes, it can. This is a, a site called Looker, where you put your, your same idea, put your company name, put your industry, and it spits out your entire collateral instantly. Okay, but it can't code, right? AI is not gonna be able to, once, once I have a, a design for my website, it can't code it, right? This is an AI watching a person draw, and as it draws, it codes the website. So the next thing is always, okay, it can code, it can design, but it can't sell for me, right? It can't create my, my slide deck. Yes, it can. This company right here, you, you, it can create your whole slide deck through AI. Another set of jobs that eventually, most people think, can't go away, but if you, if you actually go into this website, you'll see it's pretty scary. So, okay, we got the job. Now what? AI can't actually do the job, right? Disney has an AI that'll take a script and create the storyboards through AI instantly. Think about that, right? So that's people taking information and having to creatively design it. Disney's already working on a way to take, remove that. There's another slide I should add because there's even one that writes scripts. And I saw it in the last presentation, I'm gonna steal it. There was a commercial made by Lexus created completely by AI. The script was created by AI that it looked into all the old um, ad winning uh, creative and it, it saw patterns and then it created a script based on those patterns of the winning um, uh, ads. So okay, now the script. Now the actual production. To help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates a good new job. See, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. So that is an AI that took Barack Obama's face, it analyzed Jordan Peele's voice, and it instantly 
well, not his dinner, there's his dinner system. It put, it created a version of a Barack Obama saying what Jordan Peele said. So again, every type of creative job is being attacked by AI. And if we don't start to look at this and say, how do we not end up in a situation like I grew up in? So the next thing is okay, but it can't place, it can't place our ads. Okay, maybe it makes the ads, but it can't place them. This AI will look at your conversion rate and see what's working and not working and all day and all night change it. This, this is a person's job right now that it goes in and charges a lot of money. I know some of these agencies charge a lot of money for a human to look at this and change it every, every X amount of time. This is doing it all day, every day. You can't compete. You just can't compete. In my agency, we're, we're creating a, a version of this. So what can be done again? Oh, business development. You can't call and, and, and uh, land that job. You can't call around. Yes, you can. What's so happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for, Well, At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Have a great day. Bye. So you can imagine that's a sales job, right? How many of us cold call? And I had my own business, I had to cold call people all the time. You have an AI that can cold call for you all day, all night. That's, that's a pretty incredible thing. So again, it won't be me. So how do we save ourselves and our kids from AI? Someone asked that in the last talk. I believe we have to train ourselves to not think of AI as this fearful thing. I believe we have to look at it and say, how can it help us? And also, what right now am I, am I the, the best at that has me at this position or at this skill level at my career? And how can I figure out how to, how to create an AI based on that data and knowledge, right? If I can take the data of what I'm best at and make an AI for it, I'm disrupting my industry, but if you don't do it, someone else will, right? And someone else will take your job eventually. So I believe there's a way to make AI our 2019 version of hip hop, but we can still all win. Imagine if you created the version of, of your, your job. Let's say I am a creative director and there's an AI for creative direction, but I don't only say I'm gonna work on this alone. I instill I try to get every creative director I know to be part of this endeavor because they have data I don't have, just like the AI. And if we could all feed into this data and profit off this AI, that is a win-win, I believe. I believe it's going to be one of the only ways that we, as a society, stay in, in a, a way of making money. Because if you, if you hear certain politicians talking about giving universal basic income because there's gonna be less jobs, what if we created our own AIs for our jobs and shared in that profit? Maybe we can, you know, get through this until we figure out what the next stage is. So, of course, we everybody knows we're going through the fourth industrial revolution, which is what AI is going to power, and what can we do about it? How can you get involved? Again, I believe every one of us is very good at what we do. That's why you have your job. But even now, if you look at it, right, there's a lot of people that don't have the job you have because they don't have the knowledge you have, they don't have the experience you have, they don't have the contact you have. Eventually, there will be an AI that's gonna do that for cheaper. So why not be the team that creates it or tries to create it? Because I, I honestly, and, and if there is anyone in this room that still believes your job is not AIable, I would love to see a hand. <laughs> Anybody thinks that? Okay, uh, I, I hope, because sometimes I find it, I gotta add a new slide. Um, <laughs> um, but 
what I believe is, this is the greatest time in the history of the world to create anything. It's never been easier, never been cheaper, never more information available. It's about what we do with that information. Now that you know all these things in the creative field are being you know, angled towards AI, what, what in your day to day, when you're doing your job, I want you to think, can this be done by a robot? And if, if it is, I may need to make sure that I start to adjust the way I think about what I, how I do my job, or I may need to say, I need to join a, a team that may be creating my job of the future so I get to, to profit off of it as long as possible. Because I hope it's not you, but it definitely won't be me. <laughs> Is there, is there any questions, any, any slides here that you may want more information on? Any, any thoughts, period? I always like to hear because I, when I first started looking into this stuff, I, I was trying to AI my entire agency and it literally scared the hell out of me. I was like, oh my God, most people do not even understand how bad it is already. And it's going to get faster and faster. These things are gonna be coming up more and more. They're gonna get better and better. How do we sustain once that happens? And I would love to hear from anybody. Anybody, any questions? Um, do you think that uh, there will ever be a point where AI creates AI? There's already, there's already one of that. So I gotta add that slide. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, there's definitely, um, there was a, I think it was Google, created an AI to create another AI and they had to like turn it off because yeah, it started communicating. It's created a new language <laughs> that the, the creators couldn't even understand. So, yeah, uh, yeah, anybody else? So that's again innovation, right? Like I, I, I live in the innovation you know, industry and that's my job every day, right? I, I, I remember walking into the offices of Nickelodeon and, and showing them AR and then being like, okay, what am I looking at here? You know, stuff like that. And it was like, well, this is the future because X, Y, and Z and people didn't believe me, you know, and then they start seeing it more and more. And it's like, okay, now 10 years later, people are like, oh, that AR thing, that's a cool filter on Snapchat, right? So at the end of the day, I believe it's an education process and time. Innovation is innovation because somebody takes the risk, right? And, and actually dives in. So this is what I talk to a lot of the, the, the agencies and brands I work with. If you don't take the risk, somebody else will. And, and when they figure it out, you're screwed, right? Like, look at Uber. Uber was just an app for taxis, right? And taxi cab companies could have done it. They were making millions of dollars. They did it. Uber did and just destroyed them. You know, all this stuff is gonna keep happening, but if you look at it as evil and not start dipping your toe in the water, you're going, you, you can really like be put out of a job. Your company can be put out of its position at, at its brand level. Agency can be, you know, wiped out because what if an agency comes along, like I'm saying, that literally the whole thing is AI. How could you compete on price with that, right? Even Tesla saying that they can turn on tomorrow driverless taxis and it would change the cost of a per mile from Uber being $3 per mile to Tesla being 18 cents per mile. How do you compete? How could, how could you compete? Like, who's gonna say, oh no, I'm gonna stick with the people? Walmart proved that that's not gonna happen. If it's cheaper, people are gonna do it. So, I don't know if I answered your question, but I, I believe that the, the real thing to think about right now is there's never been a time like right now to create anything. So why not be a part of the creation of the innovation instead of waiting around for it to happen? And I think as creative people, we are the people that create. So AI is just your new tool. Don't be scared of it. Like jump in because if you don't, it's scary, it's scary times, you know? I haven't seen many, and, and even Elon Musk has been saying it. He's been saying very publicly, like, you guys need to start regulating this. I don't think you understand how bad it is already. Like, it is already really bad. And most people, like, when I show this, 
Most people did not know half those things exist, right? And they're like, oh, I'm safe, I'm creative. Like, no, you're not. And, and imagine the non-creative, the lawyers, the doctors, right? Like, I just showed you a surgery app that will make a doctor more efficient. Eventually, maybe doctors won't even be there, right? There's, you know, a robot, you know, who knows? I'm sure that's gonna happen too. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And, and I, I try to talk to politicians about this, but again, it's so far of an innovation, it's hard for them to understand it and grasp the data. Yes, there's a good book that I, I highly suggest called Most Likely to, to Succeed. And it talks about understanding how to adapt and how to quickly understand new complicated things. I don't know if it's a soft skill, but I believe that's where we're gonna be. We're gonna be in an innovation economy. I actually believe the fourth industrial revolution is an innovation re revolution where we have to see opportunity as creators. I heard someone say this earlier today, what we do well is see opportunity. That's what our skill set is, that's our superpower. So if we see the opportunity and can use AI as the tool, we stand to be in the best position for that oncoming problem. Most likely to succeed. It talks about like the education right now is set up for us to be factory workers. Like if you go to uh, a K through 12 environment is teaching us to do re repetitious ideas, to, to think and remember, wh which are all things AI will do a billion times better than us. So why are we still teaching those skills? We have to teach how to adapt and find new opportunity and, and work on them and, and learn them quick. Anybody other questions? So what I've heard, I know nothing is going like, you know, in, in front of Congress or anything like that, but what I've heard is humans will become their data and data is the new oil, right? So there's going to be a way where we make money off our data and that is the value that we have in the AI, right? Because AI doesn't exist without the data, right? It's just an algorithm. But if we are providing that data, like Facebook makes billions of dollars a quarter off of our data, Right? They're making all that profit. They, they have one of the smallest companies making the most amount of profit because of us. Right? So if we got a percentage of that data, that could offset some of this problem. Legislation, I'm sure there will be these companies that fight that, but I think that's another way. That's basically kind of what I'm saying. You as a person that knows your skill set, you're providing the data so you should win on that innovation. But then the people using that, so let's say Facebook, if I spend five hours a day on Facebook because I'm addicted to it because they've addicted me to it, I should make a, a few dollars on that because you've made how much off of it, you know? And I do believe with the blockchain and stuff like that, there are a lot of companies working on that idea. So regulation, no, but technology, there are people thinking like this and are trying to create mechanisms that will allow users to benefit from the, the usage of products.